Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in to this uh, webinar series, our bi-monthly webinar series. Um, my name is Mike Giardini. I'm a communications officer. Um, today's webinar is titled Decommissioning the NRX Reactor History and Project Overview. Uh, before we begin, I want to mention uh, CRL is located on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. As an organization, CNL recognizes and appreciates their connection to this place. CNL also recognizes the contributions that First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening this community in particular, and this province and country as a whole. So today, um, if you've never tuned in to uh, our webinar series, um, we will have a presentation uh, about half an hour long, and then we will leave uh, um, some time for Q&A afterwards. So uh, there is sim simultaneous interpretation of this discussion. Uh, you can access the session in French and English through the globe icon on the bottom right bar on Zoom. Uh, select the language you would like to hear. <clears throat> Please note that there is a slight lag in the translation. Um, today's session is planned for about one hour. Um, to ask a question, uh, there is a Q&A icon. Uh, so you have to type in your questions uh, and then you can do it throughout. And then we ask them at the end. Um, sorry about my voice. I'm, I'm going through a chest cold right now, uh, but I can get through it. I'll hammer through. Um, we are recording these sessions and posting them on our YouTube channel. It takes about a week uh, to get them back and edit them and, and, and put them up. If you're having any issues or would like to talk about uh, this topic any further, you can always email us at ermstakeholder at cnl.ca. I believe that is uh, it for the uh, introduction. Uh, so our first presenter today is Dean Jurel. Uh, he is the facility manager for CRL decommissioning facilities. Uh, Dean, I will just, I just have to, I'm also running the uh, presentation. So let me just pop up the presentation and uh, Dean, take it away. Perfect. Thanks so much, Mike. And thank you for joining in with us this morning. Um, we have a special presentation, I'd like to say, and we'll, we'll give it a bit of a holiday theme. Inadvertently, we... Um, we really want to present to you, um, you know, NRX past, present, and future. Um, so this morning, I'll I'll talk a little bit about NRX's past and a little bit about the workings of NRX. Um, and I have a colleague of mine, Dan Arnold, the project leader. He's going to be speaking to our present. Uh, so that'll be sort of talking about what our present project is, and then for our future, uh, we have a colleague here, Peter Reed, he's joining us and he's gonna talk about some of our future plans with NRX, uh, which are in the conceptual stage. So, so it kind of falls along the lines of um, Christmas past, present and future for the holiday season. So um, with that, um, I'd like to share with you guys uh, a really interesting piece of Canadian sort of engineering and development. Uh, I've been working here at Chalk River for the last 18 years and um, mostly around all our reactors, our research reactors here at Chalk River. And I've taken it akin to be somewhat the, um, maybe an amateur historian, I'll call myself, I guess. Uh, I, I truly do enjoy the history of Chalk River and its technology as well. So I'd like to share a little bit of that with you here this morning. Uh, Mike, if we could hit our next slide, please. So history, um, history is always, a, I feel, a very, very important part. Um, if you don't know your history, it's as if you weren't born. And I found this saying, and I find it quite truthful. And, you know, throughout my workings here at Chalk River, a um, bit of a family sort of operation almost at times. There's a lot of uh, people that share, you know, their family histories or their work histories here at Chalk River or the histories of the machines. And we tie that all together to be kind of a really important tapestry sort of. Um, and our next slide, I'd like to sort of just highlight some of the important history that Chalk River has as a site. Um, maybe we don't speak a, enough about it. So under historical achievements of our site, We've got a really interesting photo. I, I find this photo quite interesting. It, it dates back to 
probably about 1945. Um, it's the construction of Chalk River. And, you know, a couple of the highlights of Chalk River. We were the birthplace of Canadians, uh, Canada's nuclear technology. Uh, we are, we were the first, you know, nuclear installation in Canada. Uh, along with those lines, we were the first um, to have a, a reactor go critical or operate outside of the United States. So that was our ZEEP reactor in 1945. And if you squint really close at this picture, the, um, the white building sort of on the hillside uh, near the middle of the frame, that uh, kind of looks like a barn. Um, that's our, our ZEEP reactor. Um, some of our highlights from Chalk River's history, you know, medical, um, our medical isotopes were always a very important part of, of Chalk River's um, products that we've produced. So we supplied some of the first high activity uh, cobalt sources for the treat treatment of cancer. And that was produced by the NRX reactor in 1951. Uh, our, you know, research that happened here at Chalk River ultimately led to the first uh, atomic uh, power reactors in Canada, so our NPD reactor, which I believe uh, the following session today we're going to be talking a little bit about NPD. Uh, and then NPD ultimately led to, you know, the development of our CANDU power reactor technology. So all that started here on this little site that we see in this picture, uh, just under construction. Uh, one of the other things that, that kind of is unsung is the fundamental nuclear physics research here that happened at Chalk River, both using reactors and accelerators. Those were two big programs uh, that operated really from, from the early, well, the mid 40s all the way to um, really to the, you know, recently with reactors to 2020, uh, 2020, <laughs> sorry, 2018 with the shutdown of NRU, we still have Z2 reactor here running on site. Uh, so the, the reactor technology continues today. Accelerators, um, that ended, you know, around the year 2000. Uh, and the other side of our research here at Chalk River is also, you know, related to biological and environmental effects of uh, nuclear technology. So that was always a, a large focus of Chalk River's research from the beginning. Uh, Mike, if we could hit our next slide. So really what we came here today to talk is the original centerpiece of uh, Chalk River. Uh, one of the reasons why the Chalk River site was specifically built was the construction and operation of NRX. So uh, NRX is, is our set, was the centerpiece of Chalk River, and uh, the next few slides will we'll take a look at what NRX did. So, if, Mike, if you want to, next slide, please. So, what was the NRX research reactor? So, Canada's, NRX was Canada's first high power research reactor, originally around 20 megawatts thermal was its design and, and later upgraded to 42 megawatts uh, thermal. So this was not a power reactor. Um, you know, I always like to try and uh, relate to these measurements, you know, to something more common. So when you think of 42 megawatts thermal, um, that, that's something like 20,000 electric kettles that you would have in your house. So, so the amount of energy this reactor, you know, produced um, was really, you know, quite, quite high. Uh, and that was kind of the secret in 19, um, in the 1939 was the discovery of, of fission. And um, with NRX starting up in 1947, we were really at the beginning of the nuclear era. And um, the, the discovery of fission was really quite something. Scientists uh, in 1939 discovered the really interesting phenomena that uh, if you have a piece of uranium metal and you irradiate it with, with neutrons, you know, little tiny nuclear particles, um, that uh, uranium actually, if you imagine a drop of water, that uranium atom um, divides into two separate pieces or two new atoms uh, and uh, releases a whole bunch of energy when it does that. So it was a really interesting phenomenon that they discovered in 1939. And um, you know, the, the development of that 
that finding into a machine that actually works uh, was the development of, of, of reactors and NRX being the first really large Canadian effort. So the NRX reactor was constructed, um, started in 1944, uh, so that was during World War II um, by Canadian, British and European scientists that uh, joined the project. Um, the other side of history that I like to try and you know keep in mind. So 1947, just to try and humanize some of this technology and where we were, um, you know, we'll say the average worker, you know, the John Smith that would have arrived at Chalk River to work in 1947, um, likely he was would have been employed as a logger in the area and would have seen a dramatic shift in, in Chalk River. You know, the standard of life changed drastically with the construction of Chalk River. Uh, electricity was available uh, to the village of Chalk River due to the construction of this site. Um, that worker likely at the time in 1947 would only had an ice box in his fridge. So as he had breakfast this morning, he would have in 1947, he would have been, you know, taking his milk from the ice box because uh, electric refrigerators are still relatively rare. Uh, to get any sort of media, he would have been turning on the radio uh, because the CBC didn't start broadcasting TV till 1952. Uh, if he was lucky enough to own a, a car, he would have been driving a car that would have had a, only a manual transmission because the automatic transmission for the car hasn't been invented yet. So that kind of gives you a level of technology of where we're at. And in 1947, Chalk River, we had one of the first high power reactors that was you know, splitting the uranium atom. So it was truly a feat for Canada to have this. So NRX then started operations in July 1947 and continued along, you know, many years, 45 years of operation all the way out to 1992. Uh, the shutdown activities um, from 1992 uh, took about four years and shutdown activities, that's, that's unloading fuel from the reactor and shutting shutting down and draining systems and putting everything in a safe state for its really for a storage period was what was intended with NRX. Uh, and, you know, from 1996, we're right now starting to make preparations to begin active decommissioning of the NRX facility. So that's the act, you know, active removal of, of systems and equipment. And my colleague, Dan, shortly is going to speak a little bit to, to that sort of aspect. Uh, Mike, next slide, please. So what did the, res did the NRX research reactor do? Well, the purpose of a nuclear research reactor is basically to produce neutrons and use them in interesting ways. And, and NRX really, truly did, you know, live up to the fact that it was a really, you know, interesting research reactor that was very multi-purposed. So, what NRX used its neutrons for um, production of nuclear medicines. So the, the cobalt-60, which we mentioned, which was the cancer treatment or the, um, uh, they used to call it the cobalt bomb, but that, that was, you know, the beam of radiation to, to treat tumors was the original, one of the original nuclear medicines developed. Um, molybdenum-99 was another uh, large product uh, produced here at Chalk River, both NRX and NRU. Um, what that product does really, it, it's a nuclear tracer that they uh, can inject into your, your bloodstream to look at, you know, problems with your heart or your various other vascular systems. Um, and we were truly a world leader in the, the production of nuclear medicines or nuclear isotopes for medical purposes. Um, leaving nuclear medicines, we, we use these neutrons also for industrial purposes. Um, you know, cobalt-60 again has industrial uses, sterilization of, of things like needles and bandages and that kind of thing. Commercial sort of sterilization was, was a big part to, of, of the work that NRX did. Um, Iridium-192, uh, if, if there's sort of x-rays of uh, say welds being done in industry on pipelines and that kind of thing. Uh, it's an uh, iridium-192 source that was used for that type of work. 
And we also did some interesting things like irradiate gemstones. And by irradiating gemstones, it generally turned them from clear to a different color, which became uh, the, the different colored gemstones are actually more valuable. So that was an interesting part of the work that was done, um, as well as, you know, NRX coming out of the 1940s, as I mentioned, you know, the radio vacuum tube era, it also initiated the digital era. So we were radiating um, large crystals of silicone uh, to turn them into semiconductors. And, uh, and then those crystals of silicone were cut up and turned into microchips. So, so NRX really truly also brought on the digital age, uh, even though it came from an analog world. Uh, the, one of the other functions of NRX, uh, develop a, development of nuclear fuel. So the NRX reactor directly tested fuel for NRU, NPD, and our white shell reactor, WR1. Uh, materials research, uh, you know, what happens to materials under irradiation? We didn't know that uh, until a lot of testing was done with the NRX and the NRU reactors. Um, oh, I lost my slide here. <laughs> oh, we got it back. Uh, the other uh, uses of neutrons, neutron beam research, so similar to x-rays, uh, you can look at surfaces using uh, neutrons and it just reveals a higher level of detail. Um, for the NRU reactor, you know, we were even looking at if those that remember the uh, Challenger explosion. Um, pieces of the booster rocket actually came here to Chalk River so that we could look at them with neutrons to look for defects in the booster casings. Uh, and basic physics research. So as I mentioned, one of the things Chalk River, because we were at the dawn of the, the nuclear industry, we did a lot of work to understand the atom and its properties and what, what, fission, um, what, what happens in the fission process. Uh, next slide, Mike. So how did the NRX reactor actually work? So I'll take you a very high level through it. Um, this is a little cutaway in the diagram of NRX. Um, in the center of the diagram is really where, the, where all the magic happens. That's the reactor vessel. So the reactor vessel itself was a large aluminum cylinder, about nine feet in diameter and about 10 feet tall. And if you could imagine, it had 199 tubes stuck in it. So picture a pop can with a whole bunch of straws stuck, you know, at a regular spacing inside that cylinder. Uh, and that's what the NRU, or sorry, the NRX vessel looked like. Um, inside of all those tubes or straws, uh, we inserted fuel rods. So that was natural uranium metal um, in the form of a fuel rod in each of those tubes. Six of those tubes also held, uh, rather than fuel, what it held a shutoff rod. So, so a rod that likes to absorb neutrons. Um, the, what cooled those fuel rods, so as I mentioned, we had 42 megawatts of thermal power. Uh, so you had to get that heat off those rods. Um, so what cooled the rods was just ordinary river water. Uh, so ordinary river water was the cooling source for our fuel rods. Uh, the startup process then for NRX, um, the, what did that roughly looked like? The shutoff rods would have been raised up out of the, out of the reactors. So you can kind of see in our picture, um, there's a, a section sort of above the vessel itself where, where rods could be raised up into shielding. And then uh, a special substance, heavy water. So it's, it's really truly like ordinary water, but just a little bit heavier. It has a, sort of an extra neutron associated with that water molecule. So that heavy water was the secret to the operation of the reactor. Uh, the reactor was, heavy water was pumped into the vessel. And once that, that heavy water reached a certain level, um, it slowed down some neutrons to allow them to interact with the uranium fuel. And really what happens that uranium fuel, if you picture that water droplet, um, so water droplets splitting into two or fissioning into two pieces, that's really what was happening with the uranium metal inside the fuel rods. They, they were getting hit with a, with a neutron of the correct speed and uh, the, the uranium atom split into two nice little pieces. 
uh, and released a whole bunch of energy, which was, and some more neutrons, which was also important. So as I said, research reactors were, main, main goal was to produce neutrons. So that fissioning process supplied a bunch of new neutrons and supplied a bunch of heat. Um, in this case of NRX, the, um, the reactor power, you know, how high or how uh, much energy you want to create was directly related to the heavy water level. So the higher the heavy water level, the more power the reactor was producing. If you want to reduce power, you simply reduce the heavy water level. Uh, and next slide, Mike. Oops, we skipped over one, but <laughs> Mike will get that back. So uh, Peter's gonna talk to you a little bit uh, about some of our future plans. And I included this little slide here, uh, really to show a bit of a cutaway of, of the reactor structure uh, around NRX and all its shielding. Its shielding is kind of like layers of an onion. Um, you peel back the shielding layers and there's more there. So if we start at the center, um, you know, the, the shielding for NRX, um, it was, again, being one of our first high power reactor, the original concept and design was uh, to produce shielding for a 10 megawatt reactor. Um, uh, credit to the, the people that designed the reactor at the time and the conservatism they put into it. Um, they, they designed shielding very conservatively. Uh, for a 10 megawatt reactor. Uh, once the reactor started operating, they realized the shielding was adequate uh, for much higher power. So eventually up to 42 megawatts. So they, they, they designed shielding, you know, um, with a factor of four, I guess, in terms of conservatism. Uh, and when we look at the shielding in the center of this drawing, you know, the, the reactor vessel, or in this case, it says the tank, uh, that's, that's the inner part. That's where the nuclear reaction was happening inside the reactor. And to protect people from the radiation coming from that, um, there's a few different layers. So first layer that, that shows up there is a graphite layer. Um, that's, that's also to help improve, you know, the neutron economy of this reactor, or not waste those pre precious neutrons that the reactor is producing. So that graphite kind of reflects some of those neutrons back into the reactor itself to make them available for, for the operation. Uh, the first true shielding section is a very thick, one foot thick section of cast iron that surrounds the reactor. Um, so that provides one level of shielding. And then the second real thick layer is a eight foot thick layer of concrete, what we call the biological shields that protects the reactor, or protects people from the radiation inside the reactor when it's operating. Um, similarly, top and bottom of the reactor has these plates. Uh, we call them thermal shields mostly. Um, and they're really a series of, of metal plates filled with water uh, for the purpose of protecting, um, keeping uh, people safe from the radiation from the nuclear process when the reactor was running. Uh, so that's what you see stacked up on top, both bottom and top of, of the vessel um, in this diagram. So this is a bit of an exploded view. Um, Peter's going to take us through a much more, um, you know, animated version uh, where we'll see some of this in real life in the video that he'll present to us. Uh, but first, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dan Arnold, and he's going to talk to us about uh, what presently is happening on our uh, NRX decommissioning project. So take it away, Dan. Thank you, Dean. Um, and as Dean said, I'm going to talk to you about our, our decommissioning project of the NRX reactor. And, and as you heard from Dean, the, the history of this facility is, is, is very important and, and a monolithic achievement uh, to, to our country. So uh, from the decommissioning project's point of view, our, our scope is to honor that history through safely removing the liabilities uh, from that facility for, for future use of the site. So Mike, if you go to the next slide. Thank you very much. So 
how we're going to do this and how we're going to go through decommissioning the facility is, is all included in the guiding document, which is approved by our regulator, the, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, or, or the CNSC. And this details not only the methodology, but uh, our, our schedule and, and budget and scope and, and kind of the, the rules and tools of, of how we're going to go about this. So currently, what's, what's within scope and what our, our project team is actively working on is the scoping and characterization of the facility, as well as the system and, and component removal. Through future revision of the DDP, we're going to go after the, the reactor uh, segmentation plans, which Pete is going to talk to you about, as well as uh, more, more inclusive uh, internal structural removal and, and external demolition of the building. So currently what we're, what we're going after is scoping activities, taking, uh, taking Geiger counters and, and swipe measurements and, and, and things like that, and, and really understanding the hazards that exist after uh, you know, several decades of, of interesting operation. We're doing some invasive characterization, taking samples from, from unique sampling points throughout the building so we can better understand and, and develop our waste plan as well as we're doing some enabling works and, and hazard reduction and, and abatement activities, taking out uh, old uh, ACM floor tiles and, and some industrial hazards, as well as you know, in, installing new equipment and, and new capabilities in the building so we can further progress our, our decommissioning activities. And, and while we're doing all that, we're, we're removing components and structures and, and things outside of that reactor, uh, reactor core and, and storage block, which we can. Uh, Mike, if you go to the next slide. So this is what our reactor uh, hall looks like present day. It's, it's largely what it looked like back in the, in the 40s and through operation. We're moving from the east side of the building towards the west, towards the Ottawa River. And you can see our reactor block in the background, uh, as well as the storage block there. Um, you know, quite a quite a monolithic building, uh, 20 meters by 30 meters by 30 meters. Uh, as Dean said, constructed in the 40s with you know a very unique one of a kind application, and and with that brings a lot of unique challenges for its decommissioning. Uh, currently, we're going through this building, and like I said, we're removing uh, any conventional hazards as well as uh, uh, some nuclear hazards throughout the facility as well outside the storage block and in, in uh, reactor core. We're removing those experimental facilities um, and, and kind of conventional hazards throughout. You also see the experimental nine uh, loop pit in, in the ground. This was an experimental facility that was under construction at the time uh, the reactor was shut down in 1993. Uh, and this is also within our scope to uh, better understand where that construction was left off and, and develop plans for decommissioning. Um, I spoke about enabling works a, a little bit as well. The, the digital visualization tool you see in front of us is one of them. Uh, this is compiled with thousands of, of laser scans and, and data points to the facility. And this provides us an accurate 3D model that we can use to uh, you know, further planning and, and provide unique videos like this. Now, Mike, if we go to the top of the reactor or the, or the next slide, Too much, you'll see uh, all this green cabling coming into the facility. And, and this is our new electrical uh, distribution system throughout the facility. So we installed a uh, new green cabling to electrically refeed our entire reactor building. This was a, a very large project uh, over three years in duration and, and 40,000 labor hours. Uh, but it was quite important to regain configuration control throughout the facility. So, you know, over decades of operation and, and how a uh, Drawings were done by by uh, pen and paper back in the day. Um, it, it wasn't just it wasn't up to modern standards. So by electrically refeeding the building, we now have faith on, on what uh, electrical lines are live and in which ones are dead and, and safe to cut to remove. You also see a very large yellow tent. That is what we call a temporary ventilated enclosure, which is a very practical and, and useful tool to uh, contain loose contamination as we do invasive work throughout the facility. Um, You'll also hear, see now that we're over the storage block and you can see the fuel rod flask there. Uh, we're doing some scoping and, and, and investigative work there. Uh, Mike, if you could go to the next slide. So as you see in the, the reactor hall, there's many independent facilities and, and experimental systems and uh, many oddities kind of throughout this system or in building. It's, it's truly one of a kind. So how we decommission all these systems is uh, through this kind of three-step methodology. Uh, we rinse and repeat it for, for every item in the building we, we come up to. And we first begin by scoping. 
Uh, we, you know, do a, a literature review. We understand its operating history, its purpose, its current configuration. Uh, we take a, a Geiger counter to it. We, we understand the, the conventional radiological concerns and we develop a, a plan to characterize that, that system or, or that item. Uh, characterization includes taking samples or, or swipes and, and really uh, getting the, the information required to develop a, a rigorous waste stream. And once that waste stream's uh, in hand and, and, and refined, we proceed with decommissioning. And that's kind of the methodical removal of the system. And, and largely, it looks like a, a construction project. You can picture uh, uh, heavy equipment and, and trades and, and kind of hands-on work for removing these items from, from the building. And Mike, if you go to the next slide. So this is a, a heck of a lot of work and, and we have a large team to accommodate it all going through that kind of three-step process. We also have uh, three teams. This, uh, it's about 35 people uh, dedicated to the project team, uh, but we have 140 other uh, full-time equivalents uh, scattered throughout CNL that we're drawing on for support. This is radiation protection, uh, varying its trades, design engineering, things along those sites. So our, our dedicated team, we have an engineering team which provides you know, innovative solutions to get these complex systems uh, safely removed from the facility and, and really driving us through a, a comprehensive change control process so we can ensure the, the soft copy of the facility matches what's uh, currently in the field and, and, and what's present uh, physically. Once we have that, that design or, or that idea or that solution to, to remove these facilities and, and components throughout the reactor, we hand it over to our planning team who work uh, collaboratively with subject matter experts in industrial uh, hygiene and OSH, uh, radiation protection and, and health physicists. Um, and, and we develop a step-by-step step uh, step step, uh, procedure or, or work plan to, to remove those, these facilities. And, and this is really making sure we're, we're going through and we're conducting our work uh, in a methodical and, and detailed manner uh, in a step-by-step kind of rigor. With that plan, once it's approved by our, our facility managers, uh, it goes over to our field team who use a diverse and multidisciplinary approach utilizing carpenters, electricians, pipe fitters, radiation protection staff, highly, highly, highly skilled individuals to, to execute this work safely in the field. And again, just as we scope and we characterize and we decommission, we follow the same process through engineering, planning and field time and time again. And this has worked quite successfully for us um, so far in, in the safety commissioning of the reactor. And our future plans um, really uh, focus around our, our reactor segmentation. So my colleague and project leader, uh, Peter Reed, is going to take you through that now. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. So our uh, next section here is on the concepts that are being developed for the dismantling of the NRX reactor. And um, my team uh, is, is reactor segmentation, and I'm responsible for the on-site reactors at Chalk River. So we'll just dive in here. So our reactor segmentation projects are being executed with four main uh, phases. And for the work that we have at Chalk River, we're at the very first phase, the, the waste characterization phase. And this is uh, work that will allow us to understand the, um, the components that are within the reactor structures and verify the radioactive inventory that remains within the reactors. We use this information um, to help with future phases for planning of the reactor decommissioning activities. This is where we will determine the tools, methods, and strategies waste packaging, different things like this that will allow for the safe dismantling of the reactor. We then take these plans and we move through a licensing phase where we will be discussing this with the CNSC, ensuring that all of the planning and the information that we have up to date sort of supports the activities that we propose. And then when we have internal and an external stakeholder agreement that this is the plan to go forward, we would then move into the last phase, which is the more active work where we would see the removal of components, the, the cutting and size reduction of components and the loading of waste packages. And this is really where you'd, you'd see a, like a, 
uh, uh, dismantling activities take place. So there's a lot of information and a lot of work that goes into these projects ahead of the actual field work. The NRX reactor segmentation um, is focused on the structure that would have supported the, uh, the reactor when it was operating. So we see here uh, in, the, in the, the diagram, um, our, our project is really working from the top to the bottom. We are interested in everything between the deck plate and what would be the lower header room. And so these uh, structures supported the fuel rods, the isotope rods, the control rods, the heavy water system, um, the, the, the graphite that would have reflected neutrons back to the reactor, the, the calandria itself, the, the tank that was in that uh, exploded view. Um, these are all the components that uh, make up our project. And really, um, this would be sort of like hollowing out the core from within the biological concrete shields that surround it. At the moment, we are completing the waste characterization sampling of the NRX reactor, and that work is split up into three areas. Our first area on the left here is the coring of the biological shield. So we're looking to gather concrete samples and gain access to components that are um, were installed prior to the concrete being poured around them. So there are the side thermal shields, which are two very large pieces of cast iron and the outer graphite reflector layer as well will be accessed through this. So this we will see a, uh, a hole drilled in the biological shield and then this material will be, will be sampled using kind of custom made tools from CNL that uh, were developed here to gather this material. Our next phase is very focused on the graphite that surrounds and makes up uh, the thermal column and the reactor reflectors. And this, we are going through the, an experimental facility that had a beam hole that allowed neutrons to come out of the reactor structure to an experimental facility on the main floor. So we're going to be using this beam hole to access the graphite layers and uh, install tools to take samples of the graphite from the reactor core. We then move to the top of the reactor where the fuel rods would have been loaded in vertically. And using these axis positions, we're going to be accessing the upper biological and thermal shields, and then getting into where fueled positions would have been located, MOLLE 99 positions, um, going into a, a positions adjacent to shutoff rods, and then looking to sample uh, a component called the lower auxiliary thermal shield. and as well, another isotope uh, production activity uh, area that was called the J-Rod annulus and, and going in there. And really, we wanted to develop um, a comprehensive view of the uh, different types of areas within the reactor. And are there differences in the materials that we see? Or do we have a, a very uniform uh, activation of the components? Once the waste characterization sampling is completed, um, we're prepared now to demonstrate and, and walk through a, a concept that we have for the segmentation of the reactor. So we're gonna be playing a video here. So in 2023, the reactor segmentation department completed a best available technique optioneering study for the actual segmentation of the NRX reactor at Chalk River. The preferred option for the segmentation of the NRX reactor will see the in situ removal of the components using industrial robots. The reactor segmentation project will begin with the removal of the remaining rod assemblies from the NRX core. These unique rod assemblies require flasks and rod handling techniques for their safe removal. The first major component to be segmented will be the NRX deck plate. And with this deck plate removed, the segmentation equipment can then access the upper header room. The upper header room 
housed the heavy water, light water, helium systems, along with the instrumentation that allowed for the safe operation of the reactor. The segmentation equipment then gets lowered to the uh, upper biological shields. These are large steel and concrete shields, and they'll be size reduced. Segmentation equipment then moves to the elevation of the thermal shields. Similarly, these aluminum components are removed. Now we get down to the tank. So this is the NRX Calandria. This Calandria supported the fuel rods, the heavy water, the isotope rods. We will segment that using the industrial uh, robot. And fortunately, we've lost the screen. This will pause for a second. So the Calandria, when it was removed, um, we then have a large cavity for that allows the uh, equipment to uh, access other components. Sorry, Peter. I think it's it's the short version of the video, so that was that was it. Oh well, then I will verbally go through a few other phases. Then sorry, I thought it was a bit longer. So then, with the calandria removed, um, the uh, segmentation equipment. Uh, will address this lower auxiliary thermal shield that I spoke of briefly. This is one of the largest radiological hazards that we have within the reactor structure. Uh, it was installed in 1953 and allowed for the power of the reactor to be raised to that 42 megawatt thermal number that we've talked about. And it's a significant source of radiation because of the cobalt 60 that remains within the stainless steel. Segmentation equipment then can uh, disassemble the inner and outer graphite reflector layers. And then we transition out to the main floor where we remove the graphite from the two thermal columns, the north and south thermal columns. Now that those components are removed, we have access to the side thermal shields, which are large hoops of cast iron that the first one foot thick shields that Dean spoke about. These were installed before the concrete was poured, so they're sort of inaccessible um, until we get to this phase. So then the robots would be able to cut and remove those pieces of equipment. And then the lower uh, thermal shields um, can be removed, um, which are sort of the support plates that everything was uh, built upon. After all this, we see that the reactor structure will be measured for the radiological fields that still re remain within it and a suitable cover plate can be installed on top of the reactor and that will allow future phases of work within the NRX main hall to continue because we'll have a suitable shield above the the reactor for the the remaining work that would happen in the building so our team is um, very interested and uh, excited to be undertaking this work at Chuck River and we're pleased to be able to share this uh, this exciting um, webinar with you all today. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Peter, uh, th and thanks uh, to Dean and uh, and Dan as well uh, for that <clears throat> presentation. Uh, so uh, we do have some time for uh, some questions. Uh, let me get sorted here. Okay, what are the plans uh, for the waste that will be generated? Hey, Mike, I can take that one. So uh, a lot of the waste we're dealing with right now is, is quite conventional. Uh, you know, we're moving uh, steel that was installed in the facility, um, you know, way back in, in construction or, or various um, types of kind of conventional uh, construction waste. So as that's uh, cleared of any radiological concern, concerns, it's it's uh, uh, treated like any any other waste by our, our waste management team at, at CNL. Um, kind of the, the reactor is is the exciting one. So Pete, uh, I'm not sure if you want to talk about that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. So obviously, the storage of um, radiological wastes like a reactor is very, uh, uh, you know, a topic that people are very interested in. And our um, understanding right now is that the waste that is generated from the NRX reactor will be stored in approved waste packages. These waste packages are under development. We're looking at different options that exists 
um, honestly, worldwide, what is available. And the understanding is that these waste packages will be stored um, at the Chalk River site. And so that we will have, you know, sort of on site transport of the waste packages to a waste management area. And those packages would remain at the waste, waste management area at Chalk River. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and just to reiterate, this is just a conceptual uh, stage of, of this project. Um, by no means are, is anything approved, or but we do want to do early engagement, which we're doing uh, for the like this webinar. So um, we'll go from 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 here. Uh, the next question is: Has this been done before? Reactor segmentation. So, so yes, there have been uh, reactors internationally that have been undergone what the industry calls reactor segmentation, you know, the cutting up of components and the removing of components. Um, the projects are based, uh, to be honest, on a lot of the maintenance activities that reactors undergo. Um, so, you know, maybe retubing of reactors or, or fixing components within reactor structures. So this is this is technology and, and sort of work that is has a precedent that has happened. But in Canada, um, we have had very limited uh, experience with segmenting reactors. The only reactor that has been decommissioned and removed in Canada is actually the ZEEP reactor. And um, that, that first one that was critical in 1945. So we, we are, um, you know, looking to, to move to new ground here, but inspired and we have done benchmarking with international uh, partners and, and companies that are interested in this. And so we're trying to follow industry best practices and really take advantage of technologies that uh, are available at this, uh, for this type of work. Okay, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, next is, have you had any interesting findings from current characterization work? At this time, uh, no, our characterization work is at a phase where we are just finalizing the tool testing that is underway. Um, and so I, I can't really share that we've been in the field actively um, gathering samples because that work is going to be happening in the next, I would say, four months. Um, but uh, no, at this point in time, I, uh, I don't have any uh, stories to share about interesting uh, things. I think the, 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 pace, the place that I would go to is the study and in, in, the history of the reactor I found to be extremely interesting as we try to sort out how this was constructed and how it was operated and the areas that we wanted to go and look at that make the most sense to gather a very representative image of what the reactor's state is. So understanding that history and the, the operational elements and going through uh, piles of documents and, and handwritten notes and things like that has been extremely interesting, but we don't have firsthand stories yet from our um, waste characterization activities at this time. No, I, I will hop on that as well, because we have characterized some or, or many facilities throughout the main hall um, and kind of our, our recurring theme, which is quite um, su surprising, is, is the nuclear hazards that were associated with those facilities during operation uh, pre-1993 have vastly diminished. So we were anticipating, um, you know, heavy, heavy contamination or heavy dose rates. Uh, we're, we're really finding uh, close to nothing or, or nothing at all, uh, just due to the decay and, and, and through the, the half-life of the isotopes we're dealing with here. So it's um, a, a very happy surprise for, for the project team. Okay, thanks guys. Um, checking the time, a few more. Um, when will the space taken up by nrx be available for other uses so for, very good question uh, our decommissioning projects currently on track to wrap up in 2037 so you can imagine by 2040 this is a uh, return to uh, in industrial land use so it could be used for uh, a, a new build at chalk river or, or something of the sort so um not short term but uh in a few years, so the, the space could be repurposed.
Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, so we do have time for uh, one more uh, because we do have a NPD webinar next and uh, our land use program. Um, so if uh, you didn't know that, uh, you can you can sign up for that. Um, but we do. It's the same same uh, myself and uh, my communications team. So we will need a bio break and maybe to make a coffee before we start that one. So we'll get to one more. Uh, for the ones that we don't get to, uh, by the way, I will mention that we do follow up uh, with the email once we upload the the uh, webinar to YouTube. Uh, we follow up with the emails to uh, all the participants, uh, and we will get um, written answers to the questions that uh, we don't get to. Okay. Have you, all right, our last question. Uh, have you considered um, DTT, remote gamma scanning technology that is rapidly gaining traction in the industry? Um, this allows creation of very accurate radiation heat maps at varying planes for planning and execution. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in partner or in parallel for digital twin efforts, uh, the, the laser scans of the reactor hull to, to make that 3D model, uh, we can deploy, um, uh, gamma scan so we can create a heat map of, of the facility of where there are uh, dose rates. So we've done this in, in a few key areas now. Uh, future steps will be expanding this throughout the facility and you know as we go into nooks and crannies that no one's been into for a long time we can deploy that technology to, to get a better understanding where the hazards are. Um, it's, it's quite helpful for planning purposes as well because you can imagine a, a very good pre-job brief with workers uh, where you can kind of apply a very unique visual tool to show them uh, where dose rates exist and, and where they don't. Um, so yeah, a, an emerging technology and, and one that's used uh, internationally and, and one we'll be deploying here at Chalk River as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and uh, with that, we will uh, end the webinar. So thank you. Uh, very much everybody for tuning in and like I said uh, we do have another webinar coming up on uh, NPD um, so yes we will uh, uh, follow up um, with an email and uh, a link to when it's uploaded to YouTube this has been I believe our most watched webinar um, we had over 100 people this morning so uh, thank you everybody for tuning in you can always uh, reach out to us at ERM stakeholder at cnl.ca and uh, once again, I do uh, apologize for my voice today, but now if everyone gets sick this time of year, but uh, okay. So uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, we will talk soon. Thank you.